The war in Ukraine is still raging, and despite Putin's repeated failure to secure enough military manpower with actual training and experience to make any lasting headway on the battlefields, or simply stop embarrassing himself by losing dozens of tanks every week, Russia doesn't seem to be backing off any time soon. How will the Russo-Ukraine conflict progress? Will it involve Russia's inevitable attack on members of NATO, and if the bear ever decides to strike again, is NATO ready to respond? Let's find out. This is Belgium, famous for its fluffy waffles, artisanal chocolate, and for being home to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, aka NATO. While NATO's headquarters are based in Brussels, the capital of Belgium, its powerful member countries span over continents and include some of the world's most powerful militaries, including the UK, France, Spain, Germany, Turkey, and of course, the US. Impressive, right? But while NATO is composed of as many as 31 member countries with access to combined military forces of approximately 3.6 million active duty personnel, the US military is still one of the largest in the world with over 1.3 million active duty personnel and more than 800,000 reserve personnel. Let's just say it's a good thing that NATO and the US are in the frat house. Since its very inception in 1949, NATO has reckoned with the possibility of having to fend off a Russian attack. The hows and the whys of that particular scenario were always in flux, but the threat remained the same. Thanks in part to its Ukrainian miscalculation, today Russia, on paper at least, no longer presents the same threat as it once did. According to a very recent report from the Institute for the Study of War, Russian forces in Ukraine are operating in decentralized and largely degraded formations throughout the theater, and the current pattern of deployment suggests that most available units are already online and engaged in either offensive or defensive operations. That leaves virtually no troops left over to attack elsewhere, and that's good news for NATO. But because of its undeniable history of aggressive behavior under the leadership of Vladimir Putin, states underestimate Russia at their own peril. Well, NATO certainly isn't making that mistake. Russia remains its primary geopolitical adversary, and you can be sure it is poised and ready for whatever Russia can throw at it. What exactly does NATO deploy to defend its borders? NATO has had a credible military presence on Europe's eastern flank for nearly a decade now, and since 2022, it has only grown stronger. In the aftermath of the Cold War, the Baltic states eagerly submitted their application for NATO membership, having agreed to undertake the required political and military reforms. On March 29, 2004, the trio of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia successfully joined the world's most powerful military bloc. Since then, these small states, along with Finland, who just this year became the alliance's newest member, have become arguably the most important actors in a hypothetical war against Russia. It is them, after all, who share long, difficult-to-patrol borders with their eastern neighbor, and it is them who will be NATO's first line of defense in a hypothetical war scenario with Russia. Unlike Finland, who immediately brought a robust reserve of 280,000 soldiers, 650 tanks, including 200 German-manufactured leopards, and what many consider Western Europe's strongest artillery to NATO upon joining, the Baltics had to fight an uphill battle to bring their relatively humble forces up to snuff. When we say humble, here's what we mean. Estonia possesses 1,976 armored fighting vehicles, Latvia has 2,930, and Lithuania has 5,456 armored fighting vehicles, and none of these countries have any tanks. Finland also has a larger active military personnel count compared to Lithuania's 17,000, Latvia's 6,000, and Estonia's 5,000. In short, Finland is pretty hardcore when it comes to military power in Europe, and we're guessing everybody was really glad it decided to join NATO, especially the Baltic countries. As one retired US military officer noted, upon joining the alliance, the Baltic states were at one on a one to 10 scale of military capabilities. They needed arms, they needed ammunition, they needed vehicles, and they needed training, and they needed it all fast. This their Western allies agreed to provide them with the aim of making them interoperable with Western-style thinking and doctrine. The Baltic states reciprocated, having proved their loyalty by deploying forces on UN missions and making a not insignificant contribution to NATO operations in Iraq and Afghanistan. You may not realize, for instance, that it was Estonia that agreed to fight alongside Western allies in the Middle East without any national caveats, and for its efforts suffered one of the highest ratios of deaths per capita of any 
of the Allied countries. Having transformed their political and military systems in a remarkably short period of time, the Baltics emerged as NATO's most critical region. Since the early 2000s, Moscow has repeatedly claimed it was NATO's eastward enlargement that threatened its territorial security and drove it to invade its neighbors. This rhetoric has only intensified as Putin sought justification for his unwarranted invasion of Ukraine and Finland's accession to NATO succeeded in 2023. Today, NATO's eastern flank is at the center of its strategy to deter and defend itself from a potential Russian attack. This was not always the case. Similar to the way Putin cites NATO's otherwise peaceful enlargement as his rationale for fighting in Ukraine, NATO cited Putin's aggression as its rationale for reinforcing its eastern border. Back in 2014, Russia violated Ukrainian sovereignty by invading and annexing the Crimean Peninsula. This was when the Russo-Ukrainian War truly began. Russia's advance alarmed NATO members who vowed to strengthen their defenses in response. Two years later at the 2016 NATO summit in Warsaw, Poland, the alliance announced its Enhanced Forward Presence, or EFP, operational plan, a tailored forward presence to better deter a Russian attack. Starting in 2017, NATO deployed four multinational battle groups to the region, one in Estonia, one in Latvia, one in Lithuania, and one in Poland. Each contains about a battalion's worth of forces, just over a thousand soldiers, together with their equipment, tanks, tactical armored vehicles, a headquarters company, logistics infrastructure, and everything else they would need to fight. NATO cycles new forces through each battle group on a rotational basis. Collectively, the establishment of these four units constituted NATO's biggest regional reinforcement in over a generation. NATO's multinational battle groups are combined arms formations, meaning they employ infantry, armor, artillery, and air power in tandem to achieve their objectives. These unique units are extremely mobile, adaptable, and flexible, trained for an array of threats and combat scenarios. The headquarters for each battle group is integrated, meaning each nation is represented at the command post. Together, they bring unique capabilities to the table in order to bolster collective defense. Each is led by a single lead nation who coordinates the battle group's actions with the host nation, who supplies the majority of their territorial defense forces. The Estonian battle group, for example, is led by the United Kingdom, who furnishes about 800 soldiers, joined by a smaller contingent of Danish, Icelandic, and French soldiers. With its capital of Tallinn just opposite Helsinki, the Estonian battle group oversees the defense of the Gulf of Finland, an incredibly important area that acts as a maritime highway to the city of Putin's birth, St. Petersburg. Further south, the Latvian battle group led by Canada, which provides about 450 soldiers, is also bolstered by forces from Albania, Czech Republic, Iceland, Italy, Montenegro, Poland, Slovakia, Slovenia, and Spain. As of 2022, Latvia hosts about 1,700 NATO soldiers as part of its enhanced forward presence. In Lithuania, a critical Baltic state that borders the Russian exclave of Kaliningrad, Germany leads the multinational battle group, providing about 450 soldiers, complemented by contingents from Belgium, Norway, Luxembourg, Czech Republic, and the Netherlands. Poland possesses the largest multinational battle group, a rapid response force that would be scrambled forward if any others came under threat. It is led by the United States, who provides 1,000 soldiers on a rotational basis. They are joined by forces from the United Kingdom, Romania, and Croatia. NATO continued developing its enhanced forward presence in the Baltics until 2022 when Russia again forced it to reassess its security commitments in the east. Recognizing the changing security landscape, Ukraine's plight brought additional focus to NATO, who became more unified than ever. After the invasion, NATO members agreed to deploy four additional battle groups to the states adjoining Ukraine, a safeguard in case the conflict spilled over into NATO territory. Fortunately, it has not yet. But as of today, NATO has deployed multinational battle groups to Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, extending its defensive front with Russia from the Black Sea to the Baltic. According to one NATO official, these flexible units are mutually supportive and, most importantly, send a message that we're here, we're ready, and we can respond to any aggression. Colonel Di Bevan, the British commander of NATO battle group Estonia, commented that the beauty of NATO's forward presence comes in its unity of effort with many allies and partners, something Russia cannot boast. 
The fact that we are able to work so effortlessly and seamlessly together and able to integrate, he said, is a clear demonstration of the cohesive nature of the Alliance and the unity that we have, and that underscores our collective defense. As part of NATO's forward presence, it is worth mentioning NATO's Baltic Air Policing Mission, a multinational air protection mission that extends over the Baltics in support of NATO's ground efforts. Operating in four-month rotational cycles, aerial police and interdiction missions are overseen by NATO's Combined Air Operations Center UDEM in Germany, who controls multinational fighter patrols scrambled out of Germany, Lithuania's Siolii Air Base, and Estonia's Amari Air Base on Quick Reaction Alerts, or QRAs. Each mission tends to consist of a squad of four fighter aircraft supported by between 50 and 100 support personnel. Traditionally, NATO air patrols spend most of their time identifying and shadowing Russian Federal Air Force flight activity, especially around Kaliningrad where it's most dense. According to NATO's website, Russian flights routinely approach or fly near NATO airspace without using transponders, communicating with air traffic control, or having filed a flight plan. Using systems refined since the 1970s, NATO and its subordinate radar sites, control and reporting centers, and combined air operation centers can effectively ensure constant surveillance and control of its airspace 24 hours a day and 365 days a year. Rounding out its joint capabilities in the Baltic, NATO maintains multinational naval task forces in the regions composed of ships from various allied nations outfitted for an array of tasks. But the battle groups are not without their issues. Given the number of casualties sustained by both sides in Ukraine thus far, everyone, including NATO, understands that a single battalion's worth of forces would be far too anemic to actually repel a complex and concerted Russian attack. Multiple Western war games simulating a Russian assault on the Baltics have reinforced this belief. It was widely believed, dating back to 2017 when the battle groups were first installed, that they would be insufficient to prevent Russia from seizing each Baltic capital within 60 hours or less. A RAND war game in 2021 revealed how NATO's forward deployed forces would be rapidly overwhelmed by Russian forces, conducting a well-dispersed, fast-moving advance. That was, however, before they actually tried this in Ukraine, where Russia's true capabilities were laid bare. There are other problems, these more common to coalition and alliance warfare historically. NATO formations speak different languages, eat different rations, operate under different cultural constraints, and employ an assortment of different vehicles and weapons, all of which begs the question, how does NATO maintain its force readiness? Consistent training is key to NATO's military readiness. Regular exercises enable NATO's forward-deployed units to identify and sort out practical problems and barriers to collaboration on the ground. They help each partner understand the techniques and tactics of their allies. In addition, they provide an opportunity to work closely with NATO's air and maritime assets in simulated war games and scenarios designed to be as realistic as possible. These exercises essentially mimic war with Russia. Each one has two teams, a blue team representing the good guys and a red team who represents OP4, or the opposing force. It's the OP4's job to put the blue team through the ringer and make sure NATO allies get a bracingly realistic training experience. Far more than walking targets, OP4 units simulate everything from conventional warfare to hybrid tactics, working day and night to keep the training audience on their toes. This means spending long nights behind enemy lines, gathering intelligence, wreaking havoc, doing everything they can to instill the hard lessons better learned in practice than in the real thing. In air simulations, Allied pilots play the role of Russian aircraft on the attack, testing and probing air defenses on NATO's eastern front and training NATO air crews for any eventuality. Back when NATO was testing its enhanced forward presence concept, war games predicted NATO's defeat in a Russian invasion over and over again. It was startling for those paying attention. These war games opened the Alliance's eyes to gaps in its own capabilities and weaknesses it would have to contend with in a war with Russia. In these scenarios, NATO struggled to respond to an invasion of which it only had little to no notice. Likewise, it openly struggled to rapidly surge and transfer troops to the Baltics, while Russian forces only had to traverse some 200 kilometers from their border to get to the Baltic capitals, NATO forces had to travel anywhere between 300 and 600 kilometers across far more congested territory between the enclave of Kaliningrad and Belarus. 
The gaps between these regions, known as the Sawalki Gap, was optimal for ambushes with long-range artillery and flank attacks from both sides. The Latvian and Estonian battalions NATO relied on to blunt the initial shock of the simulated invasions were too lightweight, too underpowered to fight off Russia's armoured columns. The only armour NATO could scramble in time was light armour in a single striker battalion. Scrambled from Germany, it simply could not deploy or sustain heavy battle tanks in the field. Published as part of its 2016 report on the war game, the RAND Corporation labelled its outcome, bluntly, a disaster for NATO. These fictitious scenarios may have been a blessing in disguise. Fortunately, NATO took note, deciding to build and establish a very high readiness joint task force, essentially a do-it-all international reserve force of air, ground and maritime assets on constant alert to deploy wherever they are needed in a combat situation. NATO also began rotationally deploying US armored brigade combat teams in Central and Eastern Europe. On top of this, NATO has a broader response force with heavier follow-on forces it will mobilize in an emergency. At its 2022 summit in Madrid, NATO concentrated on facilitating a rapid eastern deployment by developing more pre-positioned equipment and weapon stockpiles, more forward-deployed capabilities, including air and defense missile systems, strengthened command and control, and upgraded defense plans. To make this all work, since 2014, the pace of NATO's large-scale military exercises has accelerated. In 2018, NATO held Exercise Trident Juncture to train up its response force, its largest multinational exercise since the Cold War, with 50,000 participating troops. In 2019, 28 different tank crews from eight different countries descended on Latvia to practice maneuvering, targeting, and shooting exercises on the terrain they would likely have to defend from Russia. In 2020, NATO amplified these exercises further, conducting 88 exercises that ranged in scope from anti-submarine, minesweeping, and anti-surface warfare training to extreme cold weather Arctic training and strategic bombing missions. In 2021 and 2022, NATO conducted one of the world's largest and most complex live cyber defense exercises, along with logistics training deployments, electronic warfare and integrated air defense missions, and nuclear deterrence exercises. To cultivate a sense of urgency, NATO crews must train to switch missions in a flash. For example, naval crews will suddenly go from an anti-submarine mission to passenger transport to the deployment of special forces in the span of a few days. NATO sees the Euro-Atlantic security environment as one in a constant state of flux. These changes show the alliance is adapting to new challenges posed by Russian aggression. If war were to somehow break out between these two sides, NATO would be well equipped to succeed. Its combined military force now exceeds 6 million personnel, well over four times that of Russia. The tip of NATO's spear is much sharper, not to mention its vastly more refined support structure, categorically superior in almost every way. According to Statista, NATO also has about five times as many aircraft, four times as many armored vehicles, and three times as many military ships, not to mention the backing of the world's biggest defense spender, the US. Its defense budget alone is well over 10 times that of Russia, who spent a paltry $80 billion on defense last year. The reality, if we're being honest, is that NATO no longer has to worry about such a conventional Russian attack in the same way that it used to when Russia still possessed its untarnished reputation as the world's second most powerful military. Thanks to Ukraine, that reputation is now in tatters, and NATO's allies and partners have the indomitable courage and fighting zeal of their Ukrainian brethren to thank for that. Today, arguably the best way for NATO to prepare and respond to a Russian hypothetical attack on its own members is, ironically, to keep supporting Ukraine. It not only gains valuable intelligence on their peer adversary, but bolsters its own security in the process. Every Russian tank destroyed in Ukraine, after all, is one less tank that can be used to invade Estonia or Latvia, or any of NATO's eastern members. It is therefore in NATO's interest to continue underwriting Ukraine's war effort. NATO has been clear since the start of Russia's invasion that the alliance would continue to support the Ukrainian military in its fight to restore its sovereign territory as long as Putin's unprovoked invasion continued. This decision, of course, has led it to offer almost everything short of a direct military intervention. Its members have now trained tens of thousands of Ukrainian military personnel, dating back to 2014. It has committed to train tens of thousands more over the coming years as it invites Ukrainians to participate in large-scale exercises using equipment they are in the process of donating to Ukraine. 
Ukraine benefits by gaining first-hand insight into how these systems are used in concert, something they will undoubtedly aim to capitalize on as they plan and execute their own counter-offensives in the months to come. People who witness these exercises say they feel different since 2022. The training feels more real. Countries who have not traditionally lived up to their defense commitments are now sending more troops to participate than in the past. Now, challenges synchronizing communications between British Challenger and German Leopard tank crews on the battlefield are taken more seriously as resolving them may ultimately save many Ukrainian lives. Mechanized tactics take time to master. For Western countries, it can take up to two years to blend new units into cohesive fighting forces that have gained proficiency in the tactics, theory, and practice of armored warfare. Ultimately, the provision of Western weapons is only as good as the operators who use them. The Ukrainians are up for the task, but they also have an entire Western brain trust in the NATO alliance to help them get up into higher gear. On paper, in a hypothetical war between NATO and Russia, NATO has the edge in the number of tanks, the edge in infantry fighting and armored vehicles, the edge in MRAPs, the edge in self-propelled and field artillery platforms, the edge in fighter, bomber, support and trainer aircraft, the edge in helicopters, the edge in force reserves, the edge in air-to-air -air refuelers, the edge in UAVs, the edge in airports, bases, naval fleet strength, and submarines. In just about every conceivable domain, NATO has more. Just about the only area of parity is nuclear capacity. Collectively, NATO possesses just over 6,000 nuclear weapons, virtually the same as Russia. Of these, it has deployed somewhere in the region of 2,400, compared to Russia, which has only deployed 1,500 of its own. Russia does have the edge in tactical nuclear weapons, almost 2,000 of them, to NATO's 500. But if you are going to use a tactical nuke on the battlefield, you might as well scale up to the real thing. And nobody, seemingly not even Putin, wants that. Western analysts were once confident Russian ground forces could rapidly seize Baltic territory, overwhelm NATO's frontier defenses, and seize the capitals of Estonia and Latvia in something like 60 hours. Today, estimates for this type of worst-case scenario have come under serious scrutiny. Thanks in part to the measures it has taken to build its collective response capabilities, from integrating new members like Finland, to bolstering its enhanced forward presence and rapid response forces, to conducting extensive annual exercises simulating every avenue of conflict. If somehow war were ever to break out between Russia and the West, the result would almost certainly go exactly as you might expect. But what do you think? If Putin does launch an attack on NATO, will he regret it? Is NATO ready to send Russia's conscripts and clanky tanks running for the hills, or could the bear still cause some serious damage to NATO's member countries? Let us know in the comments, and don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.